Um, now, we're going to start immediately. Michael, we're coming to you. <laughs> you have a couple of slides, which I think if I press this button, we come out just to give an idea of the, the context we're talking about at the moment. Thank you, Rachel. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm a banker, and you're going to have to bear with me just a few numbers, but I promise I'll make them very simple. Uh, there are two slides. The first one shows the overall evolution of the uh, global personal luxury good market. So it does not include luxury cars, in which my friend Andrea is involved, or other things like that, but uh, what we uh, strictly define as, as personal luxury goods. What you see there is a very attractive uh, growth profile. This is an industry which has been growing at 6% a year very consistently, a couple of blips, of course, uh, over the last uh, 20 years, but it is a great framework for uh, successful companies, and we're going to discuss those next. It does provide for very high valuation in the markets. Luxury companies typically trade at 30% premium over the market, and it's also largely a European industry. Uh, Rachel, if we can, thank you. Uh, you can see there, these are the top 10 companies uh, 10 years ago and today. And as you can see, uh, most of them are European. Eight out of 10, actually, are European companies. Um, in the time frame which we looked at before, the 20 years, Hermes went from 2 billion to the 65, 60, 64 you see there. So in other words, it grew 30 times. LVMH grew from 16 to 170 and changed, so 11 times. And caring went up 11 times in half, 11 times in half of the same period, which is only 10 years, thanks largely to the Gucci success. Perhaps I'll close by making a couple of comments about deal making, since uh, this is one of our subjects. I consider that over the period of the last 20 years, and I've been <coughs> very involved in uh, in the industry, three deals were game changers. There have been a lot of very interesting transactions, some large, some, some small. Um, but for the overall um, uh, destiny of the industry, I think three were very significant. The first one was the acquisition of Gucci by the Pinot family exactly 20, 20 years ago in 1999. We're going to say I was involved as a banker to Gucci, and we're going to celebrate the, 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 the 20th anniversary of that. But that put Caring today, it used to be called PPR, on the map. And it's now the second of, on the map of luxury. And it's now the second largest uh, player because, of course, it diversified as well, acquired other brands. So it was a platform uh, upon which uh, the second largest luxury group company in the world was, uh, was built. The second one is Richemont acquisition of Hughes net a -Porter, which I think is very interesting because Contrary to most of the acquisitions in this industry, it is a very traditional, what we call hard luxury uh, conglomerate, buying into an internet-based business. And it's still early days, uh, but I think it was a very uh, defining uh, transaction. And the third thing, what is the one name which is, which is new in this whole thing, except for the name changes? Montclair. So the, the introduction of uh, Montclair uh, on the stock market, uh, which has been very, very successful, is the one new entrant which we have seen you know, take uh, a major spot in this industry over the last uh, 10 years or, or, or more. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I mean, that's given us the, the, the context of what's going on. Of course, now, which we're going to discuss now, huge disruption coming from technology, also a debate about the capital markets and whether it's good to be a group or individual companies. But I think I'm going to come immediately to Andrea Bonami here on this point about why is M&A, if M&A is different on the luxury market, carrying on from what, from what Michael has just said. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, M&A has built most groups in industry and in luxury. It's a small, uh, uh, it's a small finite group of people which have done all the M&A in the last few years. Normal investors have had a, a very difficult, uh, uh, especially in, in, in fashion, a very difficult time, you know, because fashion is more fickle and the investors have not been ready to do, to do that. There are family businesses. It's been very, very difficult as an investor, an investor base. But the M&A is unstoppable. There is no doubt that, uh, that companies will trade and will trade actively in the next few years. And it's important that there are other platforms 
or private equity groups or investors which are able to do to do to do that. And then if you put technology on top of it, it mm. be a major change. Michael, coming back to you, why, what makes this a particularly interesting sector for yourself? Um, okay, I'm going to be blunt. It Please. is not particularly interesting for M&A bankers for a yeah. very simple reason, which is the average deal volume over the last uh, 10, 20, 10 years, I think, has been under 5 billion. It's 3, 4 billion a year, okay? Which is, you ready? 0.5% of the M&A market. So as an M&A banker, I pay some attention to it, but not necessarily massive attention. What I think is very interesting, however, is the fact that the dynamics are so different mm. from any other industry. Part of it is related to the valuation of the businesses, which uh, depends largely on intangible things, on brands, etc. Andrea and I were having this conversation before. And he was saying very rightly, you know, you're not buying a plant, you're not buying a factory, uh, but, but something very different. And that probably explains the, to some extent, the very large uh, multiples at which transactions uh, get done. That's one thing. Um, the other thing, I mean, there are also technical issues. This is an industry which has very little debt. Mm. And uh, it's unclear to me why. Uh, I think the markets do not like debt on fashion and luxury companies. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons may be the fact that you have very large retail expenses, retail store expenses, which are a future obligation, but they don't count as debt. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, the market is probably looking at it the right way, I think. But I did a, a little calculation, um, um, back of the envelope calculation. I figured if we put all of those 10 large companies um, at a reasonable debt ratio, they could, the total firepower, the accumulated firepower of those companies in terms of how much they could buy is about 80 billion euro, maybe 100 billion dollars, which is a huge number in itself it could probably buy two-thirds of the fashion industry uh, except for Chanel, which is in a league of, uh, in a league of its own. What and, uh, and I understand, not for sale. What, what value would you put on Chanel? I'm gonna, then I'm going to come to Louisa because I'm interested. I've heard some numbers of 50 I'm, billion, something yes. said to oh, me. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, easily. 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 Yeah. So no one except Amazon is going to be able to buy that. <laughs> I don't think the Werther Mayers are interested yeah. in selling, but you know, if, if they're interested, Michael is, is ready for that. <laughs> Louisa, can I come, can I come to you? I, I'm interested, this comment about this, this discussion about the luxury industry and, 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 and deal making in the luxury industry. Um, you're against other industries. You have a perspective from the executive suite of, of looking, previously you were at Procter & Gamble, a fast-moving consumer goods company, and then you were at Safi Law, which was dealing very much in the luxury sector. Do you see, um, what, how do you see the luxury industry um, evolving for investors, given you know, this, this idea of a group previously was interested to a small group of people and now it's a wider interest? And to, in the context of the fact that Orthenstein, which Louisa has now started up, is a micro-investor in the luxury sector. What I have found most striking as I got into the luxury industry about six years ago was how all-touching that industry is if you really care to look into the production, design, and uh, artisanal part that normally underlies luxury from a product perspective, and how actually that industry therefore touches society in a very broad way from a production perspective, even though the product is for the few, right? And if you reflect on that and couple that with the zeitgeist of today, where clearly, and it's the topic of this summit, rethinking luxury, we're talking about sustainability, inclusion, we're talking about a series of broader responsibilities that uh, business is expected to take on in society and luxury needs to grapple itself also with. And if you combine those two things, you know, the zeitgeist, the fact that so many people in the background, often not known, are involved in luxury, and you add on technology, 
which somehow now connects us all so much faster, so much more transparently, I think there's an obvious conclusion for investment, which is there is also an opportunity to rethink investment, hmm. right? Not in the billions, not in the big, big deals that we're talking here, but in the micro sector, using some of the uh, approaches that the big companies have used. So the fact that you are building a group as opposed to just one by one potential investments that could give you scale, again, in the small context, I think are all areas that are bubbling and that are creating a, I wouldn't say new playing field for investment, but I think certainly a, it's professionalizing that area, which in the past maybe micro investment in luxury was for some aficionados, given that we're here in Spain, let me use that word. And you know, people who fell in love with some artisanship or some mastery and would put some family money in there and meant well, but <laughs> typically didn't go that well. Uh, now I think that segment is opening up and it creates an incredible opportunity in Europe in crafts, in mastery, to potentially change the game, I would say, from a societal perspective as well, because most of these crafts are dying. Mm. Unless there is some sort of changing the game in the business model that would make them sustainable on their feet, not through charity, but through a business model reinvention. And I think that is a different world of investment from the one we have just heard. The numbers are much, much smaller, but I would submit that the work involved is at least as big, if not bigger, uh, and therefore requires maybe a different mindset. Mm. And it's protection of craftsmanship, which I know Johan Rupert has spoken about four years ago. He spoke very strongly about this, and of course, put the exhibition on in Venice, the Homo Faber, which was his concern was even the large luxury groups, any groups are going to suffer if the if the artisanal skills in Europe die, because this is something that consumers from China or from Silicon Valley want. Andrea Morante, can I come to you? You've had extensive experience at Gucci back in the old days, as it were, 20 years ago, but also more recently you sold Pomelato to Caring, a family company again, and your latest thing you've done is acquiring Trussardi. Could you talk a bit about the theme of families in luxury and acquiring companies from families and how those dynamics are very important and specific to the luxury sector. Okay. Uh, first, allow me just to comment uh, on something that Michael mentioned, and that is that when you buy a company within the luxury industry, you're buying uh, into variables which are somehow different. It's like an equ equation that has different variables all of a sudden. And perhaps I can give a, spe a specific example which happened the other day. I met with the owner of a relatively well-known brand. And he told me, look, I'm thinking of selling my company very seriously. Can you help me out? And then he shows me that he had received a letter from a family office in Switzerland. And this uh, letter implied a valuation which is totally out <coughs> of proportion with any metrics, normal metrics. And uh, the reason why he was actually doing it is because, A, the brand was going to be a very positive association with his family. Mm -hmm. okay? So he was only interested in the beautiful association and the value that it would create it for, uh, for him or for, or for the family as a whole. And the second reason why he was doing it is because he has two daughters that would love to work in that business. Okay? <laughs> so if you think about it, they're not necessarily all professional and logical reasons why you do something. And that's what incorporates a different price. And I told them immediately, look, you're not going to see a, a better price than the one you've had on the basis of this premises. So that maybe addresses the issue of the different uh, sort of logic that prevails mm. within, within the industry. As far as uh, Trussardi is concerned, which unfortunately is not on the list that Michael mm -hmm. <laughs> put yes. forward yet. It will be. <laughs> it will be. Sure. So I, th I think that there are two, uh, <laughs> two logics why the fund that I represent purchased it, and maybe there are also two reasons why it was the right thing to do. Now, the reason why the fund b bought it is A, because it fit the criteria of the fund to buy companies which were in, in financial difficulty, need to be restructured, and therefore it fits the mandate of the fund. But the second re reason, and I think it's the more important reason, is if by any chance that investment will go right, uh, the visibility of that specific transaction on the fund itself uh, will be even more important than the economic returns uh, 
that the fund will achieve from having made that investment. And uh, positive visibility means that then the fund will have access to more deal flow. It means that it will have access to more. So that, and I'm sure that Andrea's experience by selling Aston Martin is exactly on the same, on the same, same page. Okay? So that was a very important element why, why we purchased it. From the, from the perspective of the company, the reason why we bought it is A, because Trusadi has um, a unique set of circumstances, including uh, a, 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 a capacity to prove that it has archives uh, which are really relevant. Most companies say that they have very important archives and that archives are so important for the inspiration of the uh, creative director. The fact of the matter is that there are few companies that really have very serious archives, okay? Mm -hmm. And Trusadi has very serious archives, uh, which were actually uh, shown to me initially by the late uh, editor of, uh, of Vogue Italia, um, uh, Franca Sozzani. And the second reason why we, th we bought it is because uh, Trusadi started very soon as a brand which was not only a democratic brand open to a, a larger audience, but also open to brand extension. Now, if some of you saw the, the intervention yesterday with Remo Ruffini, you could tell that Remo had difficulty in terms of brand <coughs> extension. You know, he's very sort of, you know, sort of one track business, very successful. And I think when you asked him the question, would you extend, he was a little bit uh, uneasy with that. So some brands have the capacity to extend because they have it in their DNA. Some brands don't have it, okay? Trusadi has it because uh, Nicola Trusadi was designing bicycles, uh, aircraft, chairs, uh, and everything <laughs> else at the same time. <coughs> So he ha it has that, and that is obviously an opportunity for mm. a brand. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. In this context, so if we were, we've, we have the sort of t luxury terrain here. Michael, how is technology disrupting mm. the terrain for deals in luxury? Um, I, I want to give the, sim the following simple answer to that very complicated question, which is contrary to most products around the world, etc., technology content is not changing fundamentally what we're buying. Uh, the products are the same. A Kelly bag, I think, is a Kelly bag, is a Kelly bag. Mm. Where technology plays an important role in somehow disrupting this industry is more in the distribution channel and versus the retail. But I think there was a panel, so you've heard plenty about this before. My data shows that um, about 9% of luxury sales are being done online and the projections from uh, most uh, research institutes, et cetera, say that over the next 10 years, you probably get to 25% or so. So of course, that's an important um, uh, co consideration. Not the product, but the distribution. But it goes way beyond that, too. Mm -hmm. I was last week at the VivaTech conference in Paris, uh, which is this big technology fair. It's amazing. Jack Ma spoke, um, uh, and he was an amazing speaker. But the, the, the interesting thing was you had all of the companies in the world space represented there, including some luxury companies. So L'Oreal was there showing how technology can affect the way they produce and, and, and actually apply uh, certain of their products, etc. So. It's going to be there. It's going to be very important. Is it, is it going to revolutionize the space in the sense that it's going to create the product which we don't know yet? I don't think so because that's precisely the point of the luxury industry. You want the Kelly bag. And sorry for anybody who's not Hermes <laughs> for mentioning Kelly. Yeah. Andrea, what's it? because I, I'm wondering though if, if because the disruption we're seeing is from what I'm hearing from executives and speaking to Rufini yesterday, rewriting business strategy quite fast within the luxury industry. Are there more deal opportunities opening up with families, for example, who say, I can't as a small company or an independent handle putting in place a supply chain for online sales or I'm too old to understand how millennial and Gen Z and Alpha Gen are thinking. Yeah. Is, there, is there any of that dynamic going on? Well, there's no doubt that deals get done because people require an amount of investment and knowledge and stability with the supply chain, distribution, mm -hmm. et cetera, which didn't exist before. So that helps the deal flow. 
But the main issue, you know, we have about four and a half billion in, in brands uh, invested right now. We're investing another two and a half. Uh, um, the main issue is the change of the consumer uh, philosophy. If you look, we were, we're talking mainly about fashion here. If you look at it from an investment point of view, from, a, from just a, a compliance point of view, it's an industry which is not in tune with today's mm -hmm. uh, 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 consumer. There's too much of it. There are too many players. Mm. It's uh, politically incorrect. I mean, it's going to be a downer a little bit, but it's politically incorrect in the way it produces. Mm -hmm. um, it's politically incorrect at the end results in society. So if you look at it from an investment point of view, from an ESG point of view, mm -hmm. it's an industry which will uh, uh, either change, and it's having a hard time, or there will be new brands, new ways of thinking. So what's happening to, 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 to brands in general is that the consumer may leave them totally. It's not the quality of how you produce a Kelly bag, but the political correctness of queuing and buying uh, uh, multiple thousand pounds uh, uh, product. Is that the way the, 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 the economy will be in the future? Mm. Is this the way the millenniums will live in the future? So it's not, you know, a lot of people, so we have Aston Martin, we have Morgan Cars, uh, we have Sergio Rossi, uh, um, uh, Floss, BMB, we have a lot of investment in, in this thing, but will people actually live this way uh, in the future? That will, that's what technology is changing. It's the way people look at, uh, at a brand. We used to own Ducati. It's not the movement. If you go to, to somebody like Ducati, they talk to you about the technological revolution of moving towards electrical bikes. So I'm an engineer. I modify uh, a reciprocating engine, which I've done for 100 years, and I try to make an electrical bike because regulation is forcing me. That is not the risk for those kind of brands. The risk is that the consumer may see a Ducati, a Harley Davidson as a... <laughs> smelly, politically incorrect, your father's motorcycle. And all of a sudden, a billion dollars, in, in the case of Ducati, a billion, a billion euros, disappears as a, as, a, as a value. And your electrical bike, which has all the advantage, great image, electric, I'm talking about a normal electric bike, carbon fiber, etc. politically correct, no uh, uh, license, no helmet, uh, 100 miles an hour, etc. You recharge it in the office, you pick it up, you hang it on the wall, you're super cool. You take it home, you pick it up, and you put <laughs> it in your thing, and you charge it, etc. That's what technology is changing. It's not the movement from distribution, I'm going to use Alibaba. That's, that's a tool. So it's new it's brands. Yeah. New brands. You know, you're, you're so moving. this idea of, I, I know sometimes this is frowned on, but this idea of social entrepreneurism, am I using the right phrase? I know this can, it, it's sort of a bit, I mean, Michael's, no microphones for that, but, um, but Louisa, I'm just interested very quickly, what are the three things you're looking for when you're going in for these micro-investments? And, and, and you'd already raised this fact that the social stakeholder side of it, this is very much a discussion that's coming from the States into Europe as well. What, what are you looking for? I'm looking for mystery, for, for magic that can be unlocked and that was maybe there. And it's not about nostalgia, but about some story and some something that lends itself to become so exclusive, luxurious, that it could really capture hearts and minds of the consumers of the future. And I am convinced that technology actually changes and redefines the game in luxury totally. I'm very much with Andrea on that. And I see a few more steps as well. You know, where do our products come from? Absolutely. And you know, blockchain is, will change the game. Absolutely. We won't anymore fiddle around and say, is this now made in Italy according to, by the way, which law? Absolutely. There are so many and yeah, we don't yeah, really find our way across them. Mm. Uh, it will become transparent that I, as a luxury consumer, will want something that has a story, that has something that's bigger than the thing I buy. Mm. Because let's be clear, you know, I spent three months in China this year. If you look at the new consumers in China, you know, after 10 bags of whatever brand, do you need an 11th? Yeah. Or do you want something totally different, whereby I walk with my own 
made for me, only for me type of mm. bag or whatever it is. And I think technology can change custom made. It allows me to participate in the design online. And it's not about ordering on Alibaba or somewhere else. It's about engaging me and then maybe going there and seeing those artisans who actually make this mm -hmm. and will make it for me. So the magic, the story behind what you invest in, history is becoming important. Uh, you know, there are brains in this continent that exist and are mentioned on paintings back to the 17th century even. Those are really have the potential of luxury. And typically you will find in the bottega three, four people maybe who still are there and do something. And from time to time somebody goes and buys something. If you could take those brains and really, really make them through design and technology relevant to today's expectations. Let me give you one example. And I'm not talking here any secrets. I'm not invested in it. So uh, but I will share this with you. Silver. The whole history of silver making in Europe, from Portugal to, I know best, Portugal and Italy, there are others of course, to today's lifestyle, silver, just we don't have any more women who come and no, polish absolutely. the silver, right? I have mine in a cupboard yeah. and it's all black, right? Mm. And uh, I can't remember which time, last time I cleaned them, probably ever, right? Imagine if we could use nanotechnology and really think through how you could avoid oxidation Mm. in a way that wouldn't mean to put on top of the silver something that makes it less beautiful. And there are people, for example, at the University of Braga in Portugal mm. who are thinking about this. And it started off with the idea, silver, silverware is that. So no, it's not. We have things at our disposal today from a product perspective to actually bring luxury to a more contemporary type of feel. Mm. And I think technology is changing product, custom made and innovations, as we just said. It's changing production, because let's be clear, when they say that glasses are handmade, they're not exactly handmade. I mean, there is a laser who cuts the acetate. Mm. There's maybe handmade in assembling it, etc. The trick is to know within the process of 52 steps, which ones should be digitalized, mechanized or automatized, and which ones must be handmade because they add the value. And it's the mix that makes the value, right? Mm. So I think also there, technology will change production. Technology will change the way we can engage, personalize, huh? and communicate because we can tell stories. And yes, at the end also how we go maybe direct to consumer, which in turn will change how we can distribute the total value chain. Perhaps, dare I say, without wanting to sound like an activist, but perhaps going a bit higher up with the margins into the value chain up as mm. opposed to only down. Mm. And then we can preserve the arts and crafts because we have found a sustainable way for future generations of craftsmen and craftwomen. So I think it changes the game totally in my modest view. But involving the investment as well on that level. To, and the investment is the fuel of that. It yes. becomes the facilitator and the enabler. Can we do, we're going to step on another point, taking sort of a, a broader point. Um, you're investing, I mean, Andrea, you've invested in Trusadi as an individual group. You sold, though, Pomelato, which was an individual group, into a larger group. For all four of you, this theme about, is it better to invest in an individual company or are we thinking that in the capital markets it's better be to be in a group with multiple brands? And I think then there's a follow-on question about the capital markets themselves going to the point that, you know, Andrea's making, Louisa's making, and, and, and Andrea Morante at the end has made, you've taken, these are, you're privately held that you're investing. So, Andrea, can I come to you first, Andrea Morante, at the end? What's your view about a multiple brand group versus an individual brand? So, you're sort of carrying LVMH versus Montclair as your broad <coughs> brush. Okay. Um, if you had asked me the same question uh, three years ago, I would have said that uh, the, the concept and, the, and the, um, the, uh, the French way of having created uh, conglomerates within the industry was the winning concept. Uh, and as a result, uh, they would, and in fact, they have purchased one by one single companies that forever, for whatever reason have, had reached the point where they could not you know, do it alone. Mm. Okay? Uh, and so, uh, from an Italian perspective, you could argue, well, that's bad news because at the end of the day, these French companies come and they sort of choose and pick up all the I Italian companies and they make them part of their own sort of scuderia, their stable. <laughs> uh, 
I have somewhat changed that uh, perspective in the sense that I think that uh, as a result of all these changes, uh, including technology that was referring to, uh, the, the medium-sized company has a serious chance, has a serious chance, uh, and somehow medium-sized companies have a better chance of being created in, within an Italian contest, I think, than in a French contest, as a result of entrepreneurship and as a result of uh, many other reasons. And so uh, I think that the, the single company, the, the company that will start maybe with a lower sales volume but has a chance to grow quite swiftly, is a model which is going to be more interesting in terms of opportunity. It's going to be more interesting, I think, also for the individuals who manage those companies mm -hmm. because we have to think, you know, while we're talking about technology, to me, the most dramatic sort of consequences of technology is that you have to change a chief executive officer. You just have to change him. And it takes a huge time to make that decision. And I'm always impressed on how slow the industry is in A, understanding what's going on, and B, changing it. Okay? <laughs> so you don't change the chief executive officer. Some chief executive officer had not in understood Instagram at all. And, and, and they also have a very difficult time identifying a young individual who does understand in Instagram who has to have all the power to execute. Mm. And the tradition is, no, you don't give somebody who is 24 the power to execute. Okay? So in that sense, then you have to make a very sort of drastic choice. So in essence, I think that there is a good chance for the medium-sized company to, to, to grow handsomely and not necessarily for the conglomerate to be the mm. obvious one. <laughs> Michael, what's your um, view here? So there are three reasons, I think, why conglomerates have traditionally dominated. You know, strictly uh, going back to your, to your question, which is what works better in the capital mm. market. Uh, this is, there are three things capital markets like a lot about uh, conglomerates. One is the ability of conglomerates to move cash around between um, mm. developing brands, cash generating brands, etc. And if it's managed well, like LVMH, for example, you create this very, very successful uh, value proposition. Uh, the second thing is by achieving size, you can get a lot of benefits, of course. You have more power with uh, Advertising, you have more power as you seek retail space in the prime locations, you attract talent possibly more, more easily, etc. And the third one, it provides for better maybe segmentation of your markets. You can hit millennials, you can hit you know, <laughs> different type of population, you can hit affordable luxury, you can hit not affordable luxury. You can, you, can, you can sort of go across the spectrum. But I think Andrea is right. There is also a huge um, a benefit or component to the whole industry, which has to do with innovation, traditional brands, single brands, and I was mentioning before Montclair as being one of the key changes or dry, you know, defining factors of this industry over the last few years. And it's a perfect example of a single uh, brand uh, achieving great, great success. I think the question also has to do with um, going back to the management point. When you run a family company, you have certain limitation unless you really open up your, uh, your um, uh, pool to external management. Uh, when you run a very diversified conglomerate, although you know my point is proven wrong very quickly because the two largest ones are family controlled. Mm. But the idea, the idea is that you know how do you continue to develop a family enterprise outside of the family with the right type of uh, of management, which I think is is constantly a a, a challenge. Mm. Andrea, mm. you are talking on this point about held individually or in a group, you are, um, you started on a loan, as it were, with Invest Industrial, creating what you have called an LVMH of things, mm -hmm. which we've discussed, um, because you are investing in the interior design sector with Floss, B&B yeah. um, Italia. Could you just talk a bit about why you are choosing to do that? It's now, sorry, in a JV with, with Carlisle. Yeah. Um, well, of the two questions you, you pose, conglomerate or not, uh, uh, public markets or, 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 or private markets, I think on the conglomerates or not, 
the answer is very, is very simple. It's horse, uh, it's, you find a difficulty in the panel or in general to get an answer because it's different for, for right. each case. So there is no mm -hmm. clear answer. It's better conglomerate, it's better not a conglomerate. The second, uh, uh, I think, item that needs to be clear, so for, instance, for us in design, where you have small companies and we want to build the largest, we are, or we already are the largest high-end design group, um, uh, a conglomerate is essential. You must have a central uh, uh, common uh, uh, direction as you globalize these companies which do not have the size, the expertise to go, to go global. Mm. So for, for us, the conglomerate was right for this and for other businesses, the conglomerate is not, is not right. The second point, which is very, very important, there, there is where you mess it up. It's not the model of the conglomerate. If you look at the, at the conglomerates which are more visible, which are the public ones, those are not conglomerates. Those are entrepreneur people, deal machines, and there was one chief executive, one founder who did it. That has nothing to do. This is, this is Arnaud, Johann Rupert, etc. And they were able to manage the, the difficulty of the public markets mm. in a very, very able way. So they have the courage, the capital, so they've <coughs> used everything. But it's not the conglomerate model. You, can, you give the conglomerate to the wrong buckaroo mm -hmm. and you'll make a hell of a mess. Right. You give it private equity, the, 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 uh, a, a fashion company or a luxury company, and they'll make a hell of a mess. It's, it's the motion of the ocean, if you want to put it okay. that, that way. So it's, it's these people when, mm -hmm. you mentioned before, when Johan bought uh, Dunhill, everybody says, you're crazy, who would buy that? Great success. When he bought uh, Cartier, Jewelry, uh, who, who buys jewelry? Cartier, then when you bought to Dupont, people will say, I remember every single deal that Richmond did, every banker called us the price is too high, etc. We said no to Panerai. You know, they, I never heard of an Italian, uh, 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 an Italian Davos watch, and you know, Italians made uh, watches. And he went, uh, and he went very, maybe I shouldn't say that, it doesn't put us in a great, great light. <laughs> but, you know, so <laughs> as he built watches, etc., and then you know, now we are 20 years later, and we look at this and we think, huh, you know, that was a good idea. <laughs> so it's all horses for courses. So and the same thing is public and private. I, I'm obviously on the position that private is better. Private is better for companies in general, for alignment, for everything. If you look at it today, the good companies, the cool companies, are private. Mm. There is nothing, uh, you know, if in the public markets you have. Telecom companies, General Electric, um, banks, savings and loan, Banca Popolare of, uh, of something. So then when you look at the public markets, and I got math on my side, the, the, the public market, and now coming on your side, using math, <laughs> he loves yeah. math, uh, 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 <laughs> etc. this side. So, you know, public companies have shrunk in most markets by about 40%. Mm -hmm. Not, so you're left with the, you know, so you have, a little bit too much to cross in the public markets, and all the strawberries are on our side. Oh, right. That's the wrong way. Are all the strawberries doing. on Andrea's side, Michael? Oh. I come back. <laughs> so that's, that's so public and private is very difficult to run a long term business, a risky business, a changing business on a quarter okay. to quarter basis. You have to, it's a, it's, it, it is difficult, and people are doing it, but it is, hmm. they are the bumblebee. They, when you see LVMH, it's, it's, it flies, but you know. It's, it's, a, it's an indictment of your capital markets, isn't it? What mm. you're saying. But if I, was, I have a, a question I want to throw to all of you because, I, and it's specific to Italy, as um, as Andrea was saying. In Italy at the moment, it has been the sort of the feeding pool for M and A for quite a few years, going back to your 20 years ago with Gucci and Kering, um, and and also Wine App. Um, but we have at the moment in Italy, you have. A lot of those owners who are independent reaching an age where the expectation is, particularly with technology, they may find it difficult to, they may want to sell, they may not have succession in the family. Do you see um, an opportunity in Italy and two, four more deals going forward in terms of not asking you any specifics, but in terms of, well, I could do, but any terms yeah. of a pipeline. But I'm also interested about dealing with octogenarian or septuagenarian founders and the dynamic of that. Does anybody want to jump in in our last few minutes on that front? Well, I'm, if you mention um, 
70-year-olds or 80-year-olds, I'll start first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's only a question of time, and a company like Armani should have been sold before. I think a company like Prada should have been sold before. And maybe one of the weaknesses of a family-owned company is precisely that incapacity to understand when you have to pass the baton to somebody else. The, the, the company is so important, uh, in fact, it's more important than your own child in many cases. And as a result, you know, you're not going to give away your child uh, very easily. Does Armani care really about the future of his company? Does he really care? I think he cares more that to the extent that he's still there, he's enjoying every minute of it, and that's his life. Okay? So I think, yes, there will be M&A transactions in the Italian markets, that's for sure. And B, it will be driven by necessity as opposed to by virtue. Okay? And that's a shame for the people who sell, and normally it's a good, good idea for the people who buy. All right. Michael? Um, <laughs> I like Andrea's uh, bluntness, and uh, <laughs> bankers can't do that. I cannot, I'm afraid I can't yeah. mention names. You don't know which side you uh, will be, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to hedge yourself. Uh, so. You walked into that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's my business advice. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> will there be deals? Of course there will be deals. Will, they, will some of those deals be driven by succession issues? Absolutely. As I mentioned before, it does make uh, life a little harder in terms of attracting outside management if you don't exactly know what, 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 what to do with your own company. Um, will there be more deals in Italy? Of course, Italy is a fantastic uh, um, uh, uh, generator of, uh, of, of brands and high quality products, etc. Will my two friends here do many transactions uh, on this mar in this market on which they're very focused? Of course they will, and they're best positioned to do that. Do I get your business? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Andrea, do you want to come in on the sort of what yeah. you see with regard? I'm just interested about this because there's so much about this. Mm. We're sort of seeing at Essilor Luxottica a fascinating situation with regard to governance, which is all about a, yeah. a, an 83-year-old who I think the French thought was going to step aside, and he's got 31% of the voting rights, and he's certainly not going to do so. Well, I'm not going to speak about Luxottica, but you know, the, 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 there are much more Remos in Italy than you think. Uh, than ah. you think. So there is a, a new generation of, uh, of entrepreneurs, managers, etc. that if they, if they, and there is a huge capital market waiting to give them funding, uh, private, you know, whether it's uh, micro funding or, 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 or bigger deals. And you'll see we'll have a lot of fun in the next few years mm. in this industry. It will be vibrant, it will be interesting, it will be different. It will be, it will, I think it will be both M&A and new companies yeah. coming. And you've seen these cycles uh, come and go. And it's going to be, it's going to be a great industry. And can I just, a difficult industry, right. but a great industry. One final question I throw out there because we've got a, a minute and a half. Do you see China creating a luxury goods company? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Hundred percent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Got fifty percent on site, both of you. You're both looking on the outs. No, no. I think yeah. I think that China will ultimately, and is already trying to do it. Okay. Mm. It's more difficult than what you think, so it'll take it, it'll take time. It'll take time for the sort of the rest of the world to accept uh, a product which has a Chinese, truly Chinese heritage. A niche mm. product, yes. A, a broader product less obvious, but obviously for the Chinese market, yes, by all means. And do you see a tech giant, big tech, buying a big, I know we've got no. Richemont with YNAP, but do you see, and the Alibaba deal, but do you see big tech buying a luxury company, which I've heard speculation about whether that could happen? That would be, that would be interesting. I want to answer both questions with I mentioned earlier, Jack Ma spoke last week at VivaTech, and he made that particular comment, which I think was, uh, was very interesting. Uh, the question, he was interviewed, and the question was, what, you know, what do you have to pay attention to? What, what is really important? And he said, two things you need to pay attention to, two things you need to completely ignore. And the two things you pay attention to are your clients and your team. And the things you absolutely ignore are your comp competition 
Absolutely. And you bankers. <laughs> 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 or investors. <laughs> well, so the, will they, you know, the limit. Yeah, so the, the answer is, you know, absolutely they will. Yeah. Absolutely China will. And absolutely telecom companies, uh, sorry, uh, tech. tech companies will, will, will move in the sector if they, if they, if they uh, uh, see it, if they so feel. Absolutely. Which this according to change. Rafini, and I'm sure they will completely change the dynamics even Thank more. So yes. keep you all very busy in the yeah. future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.